All right, thank you guys and gals for logging in for case reviews for May. As always, this information is confidential and privileged, protected under the HIPAA Act, and that you should not share or distribute this information. And moving on to case one. Case one was a 57 year old male who was at a barbecue. Sounds like he had just arrived, maybe had a drink or two. <clears throat> and he um, was complaining of chest pain and difficulty with speaking upon arrival. PPE use was appropriate for the situation. Uh, primary survey was that this patient was awake, agitated, laying on the floor. He had an airway that was open, but he was labored in his respirations. He was pink, diaphoretic, and warm. Vital signs, I actually don't um, include them because the in this initial um, part because it took a, a prolonged period of time, greater than 10 minutes to get, get them because of the patient's willingness to cooperate. But um, many attempts were made. He wouldn't lie. He would not lie still enough to get anything. In that his GCS was 14. He was 160 kilos. Past medical history was only significant for gout, and the story that was gathered by from the patient and from his family members was that he was at this barbecue. He had uh, made a couple shots on the pool table. He started having some back pain between his shoulder blades. He went inside to lay down and at that point developed extreme pain in his left lower extremity. So from patient contact, uh, it was clear that this patient was in extremis. He was um, writhing around, he was diaphoretic. Um, they attempted to get vital signs, but despite his ability to cooperate, they were able to get not only one, but two 12 leads. I hope that this goes back to it. So uh, this is the first 12 lead. They were concerned about possible cardiac etiology given the um, ST depression noted in the anterior leads, but as well as the lateral leads. But overall, you can see this is a pretty poor tracing secondary to his level of um, holding still. That second 12 lead was the same despite um, despite an, uh, another attempt to make it to get a better idea of what was going on. Um, as mentioned earlier, he was laying on the floor, he was writhing around, he was diaphoretic, he was uncooperative, he was combative, making um, some uh, demands with some profanity. And he um, was finally able to get a, a set of vital signs at 10 minutes and the only set of vital signs that EMS were able to get. So his heart rate was 100, his blood pressure was 90 by palp, he's tachypnic yeah. at 28. No SpO2 could be obtained as the patient oh. truly was this um, agitated. Make sure your mic is muted. And uh, they felt that his GCS was 15, despite his um, behavior. And so they elected to start transport at 14 minutes, code three to Peace Health, um, and spent the rest of the time in route trying to just keep the patient on the gurney because he was so agitated and arrived 21 minutes after um, patient contact to the hospital. I thought with this particular patient, uh, as well as what was documented that the where we really excelled was that we got a 12 lead and not only one tried to get a better idea if this patient needed a STEMI activation, so a second 12 lead. Um, it, we were persistent in trying to obtain vital signs we knew that something was wrong, something um, gravely wrong, but we couldn't figure out exactly what it was from my understanding in that um, nonetheless, we did set up the hospital for code three and that this patient was extremely difficult to assess, to um, evaluate or to treat. So they, they really excelled in what they could do given the circumstances and they really didn't have any concerns with the care. Um, they. The hospital notification was that this patient was possible cardiac, but also behavioral, um, very uh, agitated and uh, limited amount of information available um, by the Pulsera. So in the emergency room, he um, was again 
writhing around. I don't even believe that the seatbelts were on the pram because he wouldn't tolerate anything restricting him in any way. Uh, they moved him. He was on a nasal cannula, from my recollection, was moved over to the uh, hospital bed and noted to have sats of 80 percent um, and was placed on a non-rebreather. He was extremely diaphoretic, very difficult to get any um, any uh, leads on him and also very difficult to get him to hold still enough to get any uh, a blood pressure cuff. So very similar presentation for EMS um, in the hospital. 12 lead was obtained pretty early on, given the report that there was ischemic changes noted on the free hospital 12 lead. And we also could add about an equal quality tracing as EMS was able to get, noting that he had diffuse ST depression, pretty much um, in the same distribution, as well as ST elevation and AVR. But he didn't quite present as a typical STEMI um, in in watching him almost fighting fighting our hospital staff, it started to become more and more clear that his pain seemed out of proportion given that he had some chest pain, he was short of breath, um, and his he overall was concerning for a possible dissection. Uh, early on, defibrillator pads were placed on him. He had his systolic or his uh, Blood pressures assessed in both upper extremities, which there was a pulse deficit. I believe the left was lower than the right. Um, he kept on screaming about his left lower extremity. He kept on saying he couldn't breathe. He kept on trying to get off the bed. Um, but we were able to also assess that his femoral pulses were palpable and they seemed symmetric um, in that a bedside ultrasound was obtained early to determine if there was any evidence of a pericardial effusion given the concern for dissection potentially um, extending to the pericardium. Uh, pain control was initiated once IV access was obtained and that did significantly improve his cooperativeness with the assessment. Cardiology was consulted uh, given his EKG changes, mm -hmm. but CT surgery or cardiothoracic surgery was our predominant um, concern for this patient. And there was a question to pos uh, question to a pericardial effusion, so cardiology was also involved to try to get us a stat formal echo to determine if this patient did have a pericardial effusion. Um, important for us to determine because one, uh, if it's an acute pericardial effusion, it could lead to cardiogenic shock. And he did seem like he was having um, profound shortness of breath with crackles in his his uh, pulmonary assessment. And secondly, our medications could substantially um, impair this patient's perfusion if he was having a pericardial effusion. So something that we were very focused on trying to differentiate or determine. So with the with the further about review of the ultrasound um, of his heart, it looked like he may have just had a trace pericardial effusion, nothing substantial. He was able to go to the CT scanner and get a CT of his um, aorta. Um, which I'm going to show you here. So this is um, a cross section of his body going from his head down to his toes. The right side is going to be where you can see hopefully my um, arrow and the left side uh, is on this side. So this is a patient that was complaining the entire presentation of left lower extremity pain. Uh, what we're going to be looking at is his aorta and, oops, let me make the ball up, that stop. And then um, we're going to give you, so you're looking for the aorta that's filled with contrast, which is this part right here. Um, as I play the video, the arrow will be on his aorta for most of the time, actually, um, his descending aorta, you'll see the arrow will be laying on there. And you're looking for when contrast doesn't fill the uh, aorta entirely, um, there'll be a line, as you can start to see here over his aortic arch, that that line represents the tear, true and false lumen, or his dissection. So you can see that he's dissected down to his probably abdominal aorta, or past the diaphragm, now his abdominal aorta, 
Um, and then as it slips, uh, splits into his, you can see that he's dissected down to both of his iliacs. I guess I'll play it one more time so that if it was too fast now that you've oriented yourself. Uh, so he had um, a large dissection from his, at least his aortic arch down to his iliacs involving both his right and left iliac. And uh, given that it started up at the arch, this was a type A dissection. So based off of that, we'd already had the meds um, prepped as malol and nicardipine to manage this, what we thought would be a dissection. When he came back from the CT scanner, he had worsening shortness of breath. Nurses uh, called me into the room after um, talking with a family with the cardiothoracic surgeon and reported that he was starting to have hemoptysis. When we, uh, when I came in and evaluated the patient, he was he was coughing up pink tinge sputum. He was becoming more hypoxic and the decision was made to RSI him. He was uh, flown over to OHSU. And I believe we have Dr. Lance, our cardiothoracic surgeon um, of record the uh, at OHSU who will be able to give the hospital follow-up. Is Dr. Lance on the call? Hi, it's, it's Green Lance. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, hi. So uh, thank you, Dr. Gadbois. Um, that's an excellent introduction to this uh, very challenging case. Uh, so I uh, received a call from Dr. Gadbois while the patient was in the emergency department uh, before the CT scan, and uh, she uh, quite expertly picked up that this patient was showing uh, um, signs of an aortic dissection based on the uh, uh, acute onset and quality and distribution of his pain, uh, as well as his unequal uh, upper extremity blood pressures. Uh, there was concern uh, that he may have a, per a pericardial effusion, um, which uh, can complicate an aortic dissection by causing uh, tamponade and is, is one of the more frequent ways that those patients die. Uh, and, you know, for that reason, despite his respiratory distress, um, we agreed that it would be... Uh, um, dangerous to uh, uh, give him induction for intubation as patients with tamponade uh, frequently can decompensate under those conditions um, until we could get some better echo images. We were able to decide that he uh, um, he did not appear to have uh, cardiac tamponade uh, and and we were able to uh, get him to the CT scanner and and, and uh, you know truly diagnose this aortic dissection. The dissection um, as we saw on the CT scan extended from the you know, the, basically the entirety of the aorta from the, the heart, you know, aortic valve, um, you know, aortic root, ascending aorta, aortic arch, and descending aorta all the way to the iliacs. Um, we activated the operating room at OHSU um, and it's because we, we don't do aortic dissection uh, surgery at P-Self and transferred him uh, by life flight uh, as soon as possible. Uh, on his presentation to the OR, we did a transesophageal echocardiogram, which uh, you see these images here. Uh, and he had a really interesting finding here. The, the, um, when we talk about aortic dissection, what we're talking about is, is blood has entered the, um, the wall of the aorta and the intima, which is the inner layer of the aorta, has separated from the rest of the aorta. And um, you know, blood tracks through the through the layers of the wall, uh, and what can happen? You know, we worry about rupture, but the other things that happen is that this intimal flap can obstruct blood vessels and cause malperfusion to organs, can cause malperfusion to the brain. It's the reason for the different blood pressures in the different arms when you when you have obstruction of the subclavian vessels from these intimal flaps, and it was the reason why he had a painful uh, left leg. Uh, he had malperfusion because the intimal flap had uh, had uh, cut off the blood supply to that leg. Now, this uh, this transesophageal like a cardiogram sh showed something really interesting, which is that the intima of the ascending aorta had separated from the from the rest of the layers of the aorta so much so that it, it prolapsed down into the heart, 
through the aortic valve like a windsock uh, where you can see it falling into the heart here and and, uh, and then ejecting back out. And what this did physiologically is cause severe uh, aortic insufficiency. The, the aortic valve uh, no longer had any resistance to flow of blood back into the heart. So he had acute aortic insufficiency, which had caused him to have flash pulmonary edema, and also with that problem and and the addition of the intima probably having some, you know, dynamic obstruction of his coronary arteries, he was probably having some coronary ischemia for, for both of those reasons. And, and severe acute aortic insufficiency causes, you know, essentially instant heart failure, and he was likely in respiratory failure from flash pulmonary edema uh, that's from that problem. So, you know, aortic dissection, you know, type A aortic dissection, which is it, it, when it involves the ascending aorta, uh, is a surgical emergency. We did proceed with, uh, you know, surgery as soon as we could get him to the table, essentially. And uh, this was a kind of a long marathon overnight case. Uh, um, I replaced the aorta from the aortic root, including replacing the aortic valve um, and reimplanting the coronary arteries. Um, replaced the ascending aorta, replaced the whole aortic arch, and uh, put an endograft uh, from that site down into the descending aorta to try to um, you know, reapproximate the, la the layers of the aorta to try to get flow back into the true lumen um, of the aorta. Um, the descending aorta in order to reperfuse his his uh, his leg uh, and uh, you know all of his visceral organs. So uh, you can you can sort of see in the picture. I don't know, uh, Dr. Gadbois, if you can blow up the picture in the top right of the screen. Yeah. Um, you know that shows uh, sort of the um, you know the areas of the aorta that needed to be replaced. Um, so this ended up being about a 15-hour operation. Uh, to get all this done, um, he went to the ICU. The you know essentially the following morning after the operating room, um, in very critical condition on um, you know maximum uh, doses of pressors and inotropes. He was on you know epinephrine, norepinephrine, um, milrinone, and vasopressin, and essentially you know max doses of all of those things uh, in order just just have a survivable uh, blood pressure. Um, over the next few days, he, um, you know, over the next couple of days, he had, um, you know, essentially been stable on those doses. However, at those maximum doses of, of vasopressors, um, you have other problems that that causes um, due to malperfusion from all the, the, the arteries that are clamped down as a result of that medication. Um, he had a, a rising lactate that made us concerned that he had um, some intra-abdominal malperfusion, but, you know, we were worried about having dead bowel. So um, we asked our general surgery colleagues to do a bedside uh, exploration. They opened his abdomen and uh, did not find any dead bowel. However, it was, uh, you know, all of his, his organs were uh, sort of globally malperfused, and we determined that that was from the high doses of the pressors. And so we, um, you know, gave him some some boluses of, of other medications, got the, got the the vasopressors doses down enough to get, get better perfusion to his visceral organs. And from there, he uh, slowly improved. Um, he woke up um, about a week after the surgery, um, began to have improving level of consciousness over the next several days. Um, in the meantime, he was on dialysis for renal failure. He had um, fasciotomies in uh, all of his extremities uh, because he had um, malperfusion for so long. Um, and, um, you know, over the course of the next, uh, you know, two and a half weeks, he, uh, really showed steady improvement, was more, uh, mentally interactive. Um, you know, all of his labs had normalized. He was on room air. Um, you know, he was, you know, kind of, you know, being moved from the bed to the chair and spending some time in the chair, uh, and showing signs of being, uh, you know, on the verge of being ready to transfer, uh, out of the ICU. Um, before he made that move, though, he uh, showed us an increasing lactate, uh, increased about 10, um, some mild cardiac dysfunction on an echo, 
and uh, some altered uh, level of consciousness that, that uh, sort of just general confusion and less interactive. Um, that you know none of these things were were really well explained. Um, and then you know from that point he he rapidly decompensated, became bradycardic, became asystolic, and uh, eventually passed uh, after a you know a long course in the ICU. Uh, you know after a very long operation. And uh, I'll tell you, I, I'm actually I'm not sure why he uh, why he ultimately died. Uh, we didn't ever find a cause uh, for those events. Um, but I'd be happy to uh, take any questions or any follow up from Dr. Kedwa. Thank you so much, Dr. Lance. Um, as a, a interesting, not just because, not only because you're a cardiothoracic surgeon, as giving everyone a little bit of um, um, information about uh, Dr. Lance's history, is that he too was a former paramedic uh, in the Oregon uh, area. But I don't have any questions. Thank you so much for that detailed um, for hospital follow up. Does anybody on the call have any questions? I don't think so. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Lance. Uh, if no one else has any other questions, we'll move on to case two. Oh, with a thank you bit, very much. Yeah, with a little bit of uh, background on aortic dissections. We discussed this, I believe it was probably about six months ago, but this is just a reminder of some of the details about aortic dissections. Um, incidence is not very frequent. We see about five to 30 cases of this per million uh, people each year in the United States. Uh, there's a predominance in black um, in the black population compared to the white male uh, population or male gender distribution is three to one to females. And that this usually uh, occurs in the ages of the fourth through the seventh decade. Uh, we talked, um, or Dr. Lance had mentioned about the separation of layers. There's two types of um, classification, Stanford and DeBakey. Uh, I usually use the Stanford and this differentiation between type A and type B dissections in the Stanford uh, classification is, is based off of, does the dissection start at the aortic arch? As you can see here, that it does in um, this image here, it actually it started below and kind of um, retrograde up towards the arch. And then uh, this is a type B, so not um, at the origin of the arch again. And uh, the mortality of a dissection is upwards of 30%. These patients will present with acute pain approximately 85% of the time based on location. They might have different types of pain. Uh, as mentioned in this particular one, the guy had chest pain and also lower extremity pain. Although 15% will have no pain complaints at all. They may just have jaw or neck pain. They'll be short of breath. There'll be some vital sign abnormalities, usually tachycardia and hypertension, but sometimes hypotension, especially if there's perfusion to uh, the cardiac, uh, to the heart, or um, if there's a um, pericardial effusion associated with it, pulse, pulse deficits will be present up to 31% of the time, and that's when the pulse feels um, either not palpable or weaker than the other side. And then aortic regurgitation or um, insufficiency will occur up to 50% of the time with patients with type A dissections, as was the case with this particular patient. And that if the um, dissection involves subclavians, so usually in the arch or type A dissections, they may present as neurological abnormalities and sometimes have uh, can be confused with a stroke. Risk factors are going to be hypertension, smoking, any kind of catecholamine, um, so your meth and your cocaine um, individuals. And then treatments really geared um, in the pre-hospital setting, early 12 lead, serial vital signs, at least getting IV, um, an IV established, if not two. And uh, you may give some fluids and see some reflex tachycardia related to the fluids. You want to make sure they're on the monitor and to uh, give them oxygen if they are hypoxic. Um, and then the hospital management uh, is going to be depending on if it's a dissection involving 
a, like a type A dissection, which is always a surgical emergency that has to be repaired uh, in the operating room. And then type B's dissections, those are the ones that are descending aorta dissections, are all medically managed. They don't have to be um, sent to the OR or at the at Peace Health's uh, case transferred out to a different hospital. And then I did a brief um, search of dissections in our protocol. It, come, it came up twice under syncope, so a syncopal episode might be attributed to a thoracic aortic dissection in that if there is concern for dissection, that is a contraindication of giving aspirin. All right. In the interest of time, I'm going to move straight to case two, 38-year-old male complaining of shortness of breath, not alert. PPE usage was appropriate. He was um, responsive to pain. He was had an open airway, but it was labored. There was accessory muscle use. He had no active bleeding. He had a pulse, but he was pale and diaphoretic. Um, vital signs here were greater, I'm pretty sure it was greater than 10 minutes is why I have the question mark, but uh, heart rate of 90, blood pressure 110 over 72. His respiratory rate was 36%. His initial SpO2 was 75% on room air. And he's 125 kilos. And based off of his um, based off of his weight and height in the hospital, I believe it was 40, his BMI was 47. He had a past medical history reported of cystic fibrosis, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and hyperlipidemia. And the story provided to EMS by family was that he woke up two hours ago feeling short of breath, and that has progressively worsened. He is supposed to be on chronic O2 um, supplementation, but he oftentimes was non-compliant, and I believe that was the case this time, in that, in addition, he was diagnosed with COVID six days earlier. Initial uh, disregard on my question mark there. So initially, um, after patient contact, oh, actually, I, I do remember now. So he was only, we were only get able to get, uh, or it was only documented to have a um, pulse ox of 96%. And that was after, and then I will say that these are AMR's vital signs and times. Um, the uh, fire department was on scene. I don't have access to their records, so I can't tell you what the vital signs were um, on their assessment, but the first vital signs recorded by the transporting unit are uh, here. So his temp was 98.4 and 18, he was placed on a MedNeb and CPAP. Um, his GCS was noted to improve uh, to 14 out of 15 and that his extremities were cyanotic and he was cold. 18 minutes after patient contact, uh, a full set of vital signs are recorded by the transporting uh, unit. So he's got a pulse of 62, a blood pressure of 127 over 95, and a respiratory rate of 36. Um, they start transport at 25 minutes, noting that his pulse ox is 94%. His blood glucose is not the etiology for his obtund um, altered mental stress or obtunding in that uh, they note five minutes after transport, his SATs are 60% and they don't improve substantially despite um, reassessment on hospital arrival. So PPE usage was appropriate, especially given that they later found out that this patient was um, COVID positive and then also the fact that he was on um, positive pressure ventilation. Uh, make sure you document a HEPA filter, but they got him on um, they got him on pro, uh, CPAP, and they documented a MedNeb, although that's not in the, in the procedures, but it might be just a omission in documentation. There was no end tidal CO2 documented for any of the transporting agencies um, course. Uh, given that this patient it has multiple comorbidities for cardiac disease, and um, although he's diagnosed with COVID recently and has an underlying pulmonary problem, it would be advantageous to get a 12 lead, get IV access, and to get more than one set of vital signs during that 45 minute um, contact. In the emergency room, the history that this patient actually had besides the recent diagnosis of COVID was that he had chronic hypoxic respiratory failure, why he was on oxygen, and that was because of his 
interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis secondary to um, a pneumonia, eosinophilic, eosinophilic pneumonia when he had as a child. Um, in the emergency room, he had a respiratory arrest followed by a cardiac arrest. He was intubated during that um, resuscitation and ROSC was achieved after three cycles with epi. His hospital course, he was prone. He was treated with steroids and antiretrovirals um, to help with his pulmonary function and dynamics given mm. his underlying lung disease and his COVID diagnosis. He did not have a PE despite having COVID. Um, targeted temperature management was uh, initiated for this patient following cardiac arrest. An echocardiogram was done during his hospital course, noted that he had acute on chronic heart failure and that he was also in cardiogenic shock, requiring both norepi and dopamine for his pressors um, or for his management. And then he was in renal failure that was um, treated with fluids. On hospital day seven, he had worsening hypoxia despite um, despite uh, positioning of his body. He had a code blue. They were able to get Ross back after one round. Um, later on that evening, he again had another code blue. Uh, his family had elected to keep him full code despite his grave condition. After one round of CPR and ACLS, he did not have a pulse. Um, so the team decided or moved towards um, pronouncement given the futility of his um, his condition as well as the exposure of all hospital um, personnel with his COVID diagnosis. So I thought this would be a good opportunity to talk about pulmonary fibrosis, especially I probably was per, um, relayed by family that he had cystic fibrosis, which is different than pulmonary fibrosis. Um, uh, pulmonary fibrosis is when there's any scarring or damage to the lung. It can affect any part of the respiratory system, trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, bron um, alveoli, and it causes thickening and stiffness and that impairs the gas exchange. Um, once it, the damage is done, it cannot be repaired in that it's more common in males um, and usually occurs later in life in the fifth and sixth decade. Uh, cystic fibrosis is different. It's congenital um, in the sense that uh, there's inflammation, there's secretions, and uh, similarly, it has a, um, a natural progression to a shorter uh, lifespan for these individuals. The causes for pulmonary fibrosis of the known causes, there's approximately 200, and then there's one additional idiopathic unknown etiology. Um, so of the known causes, they are broken up into occupational. Uh, you can probably see all those like um, silica and like uh, those, of course, I'm going to forget the name, but those that um, deal with uh, HVAC systems, old HVAC systems um, that are oftentimes uh, commercials with, with lawyers about getting your due justice. Um, idiopathic connective tissue disorders such as uh, such as um, lupus and then systemic diseases. Um, some medications have been implicated, such as amiodarone, um, some antibiotics, and then uh, radiation therapy can also contribute to pulmonary fibrosis. These patients will um, complain of usually just respiratory complaints that we're familiar with, um, like dry cough, shortness of breath, fatigue. They'll have weight loss because of the increased amount of energy required for them to ventilate their body. We may see physical findings such as clubbing, which is demonstrated in this picture on the right, uh, where the nails are kind of um, enlarged and uh, rounded. And then um, treatment is usually supportive um, oxygen to help them feel like they're not as short of breath, pulmonary rehab. Um, some patients will go on to get a lung transplant. And there are some medications like nitatidum <laughs> and uh, perfinidone. Um, the mechanism action for the first one is unknown, but the second one is a cytokine um, inhibitor uh, trying to decrease the amount of um, the immune, immune system attack on the pulmonary tissues. And then our um, protocol for shortness of breath 
again, we've talked about this, but um, this patient probably falls more under the COPD asthma. So if there was, and then also with the known diagnosis of COVID makes it a little bit more complicated about if we're gonna use any kind of bronchodilators, but um, getting them on oxygen and getting positive pressure ventilation if possible to help with this patient's um, pulmonary function. And uh, if he is um, does not meet the criteria for positive pressure ventilation, if he's too obtunded, if he's not protecting his airway, if he's vomiting, moving towards uh, RSI, knowing that he has all of the conditions that make it um, likely to be a difficult um, intubation. He's obese, he has little pulmonary reserve given his underlying pulmonary uh, disease, but also has COVID and likely will, um, if not just for his pulmonary fibrosis, but with COVID will likely desaturate quickly despite uh, pre-oxygenation. Any questions or concerns before moving on to case three? All right. Okay, Dr. G Jackie. Yeah. Um, a quick question. Um, from your review of this, would you have would you have intubated this person earlier, knowing it's going to be a difficult intubation? So, if the question is for me, yes. But if the question is for if I had the option to. If I was in the pre-hospital setting and I knew that this was a potentially very difficult intubation and I could get their SATs up to get them kind of limping towards the hospital where there's more resources, I think that that seems like it might be a valuable um, consideration, especially because if you can't ventilate this patient and now you paralyze them and now you can't oxygenate them, the time of the time without without ventilation is brain, and if that means, like for example, this crew, I think it was forty six minutes. I mean, they were able to get a Sats up with the non breather, and then moving towards the CPAP. But if his Sats were sixty percent, you know, from from initial contact, that's forty some minutes of hypoxia. So I think that. My answer would be for me in my setting, yes, because he clearly is at this point sats of in the 60s. Um, like, let's say that if he presents the emergency room sats in the 60s without the, with the measures that have already failed, I think that it's worth trying to do supportive measures to see if that is enough, knowing that he would be a difficult intubation likely. What point, uh, you know, I mean, so we essentially have uh, 16 minutes, at least 16 minutes, documented 16 minutes of extremely low O2 sets. I mean, essentially 60% is, is, is venous blood. Uh, so uh, is, this was probably during transport. I don't know. What's the bolded is... Um bolded 25 is when transport was started. Okay, so the, he deteriorated during transport, which which probably makes sense, uh, but uh, uh, is there a way to, would there have been a way to assist his, uh, his uh, oxygenation at that level? I mean, it, well, sedation and uh, a BVM uh, with high, high flow O2, uh, what, what's your thought? Yeah. Um, so in that question, that would probably be more ideal. I assume that this patient was more back to his obtended level like he was um, when first contact. And I believe that uh, the transporting crew documented that his uh, GCS was eight with fire. So this patient can't tolerate or doesn't meet the criteria of having CPAP anymore if his if his if he's unable to protect his airway. Um, if he was able to protect his airway and you thought that there might be some tongue manipu uh, tongue etiology for why he was hypoxic, you could place a nasal pharyngeal airway. But once it becomes clear that you can't get that he doesn't meet the criteria for having um, 
a positive pressure ventilation mask by CPAP, then taking off the mask and putting in nasal adjunct if he, because assuming he can't tolerate an OPA and trying to bag him might help. Um, otherwise, it would be intubation. Yeah, I guess my point is that that doesn't appear that that CPAP was appropriate at no. that during transport. Uh, that another another method of uh, of getting positive pressure ventilation to him basically uh, would have been indicated. Now, of course, that's fraught with danger too, because because like, like you say, if if he's got you know if he's obtunded, he also may start vomiting, et cetera, et cetera, but that's, you know. Yeah, I think that um, it'll be very important to, I mean, it'd be very important to manage his, his uh, pulmonary function in, you know, the complicating factor is that, is that, is this COVID hypoxia or is this, you know, with, without COVID, I think it becomes quite clear that his SATs are not going to be something that he's going to tolerate very quickly or very well um, over the short term. But, you know, of those people that are working with COVID patients, they might have SATs in the 80s, 70s or 60s and be completely awake. But in the context, I I'm assuming that this patient was not awake and uh, was was dozing off or um, bobbing his head or not doing anything with um, any type of uh, motor assessment. So it'd be nice if we knew if we had some if we had a a, a CO2 as well. So correct. Um, okay, enough of that. Yeah, in my experience, just for the record, between sea level and um, seven thousand feet, is that. I'm not really seeing any people at sea level with SATs in the 70s or 60s that are happy hypoxic COVID patients. I might be seeing them in like 80s um, in the sea level population. Where um, at the uh, at the 7,000 feet above uh, sea level, where I practice as well, these patients may come in with a surprising SAT of 60 or 70 percent and just look kind of short of breath with COVID. So oh. 60s in my experience in the sea level is not just your happy hypoxic COVID patient. These are, these are patients that are circling the drain fast. Well, we noticed that this, this gentleman um, decompensated almost immediately on hitting the ED and uh, went to, and became, um, and went into arrest. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, no one else has any other questions. We'll move on to case three. 25 year old male in um, police custody. The call out was unknown. Um, what information was available is that uh, he was evading the police. Um, PPE usage was appropriate for the situation. Uh, his, he's awake, he's in the back of a police car, his airways open, he's unlabored. His pulse is present and there is no signs of active bleeding. Uh, vital signs were obtained 12 minutes after patient contact, um, but that was because of the patient's cooperativeness. Heart rate of 142, blood pressure was not taken. His respiratory rate is 26. His SATs of 96% on room air and he's 75 kilos. Past medical history was attempted to be obtained, but the patient was not cooperative with that information. In the information that um, was available, I believe, came from law enforcement in that this patient had crashed his vehicle into a chain link fence. He fled the scene. Um, he, police were able to get in touch with him when his car broke down short duration from where he had crashed. Um, the police were chasing him. They took him down to the ground. He did not lose consciousness. He did not strike his head. He was combative and spitting. Uh, they believe that he was under the influence of drugs, but he also had some um, uh, alcohol paraphernalia in his vehicle. So they suspected that he also had alcohol on board and his vehicle was nearby for EMS to take a quick look in the um, inside and outside of it. And they didn't see any significant damage uh, to that vehicle. So vital signs, as uh, reported on that previous slide, he was verbally assaultive. He threatened to get out of restraints. He was kicking at providers. 
Um, he was placed in soft restraints prior to removing handcuffs, and then he was placed in um, the seatbelts of the gurney. Uh, our fire colleagues had documented in their uh, narrative that it required no less than six people to get him on the gurney. And he was non-cooperative, trying to bite at anybody that got close to his mouth. He um, was flailing his chest and his head. Uh, our our transporting crews documented that they tried to de-escalate him verbally. And then finally, the decision was made to chemically restrain him at 13 minutes um, from patient contact. So he received, at the same time, um, 50 milligrams of Benadryl, 5 milligrams of Brissed, and 5 milligrams of Haldol. Uh, then his blood glucose was checked a minute afterwards, a full set of vital signs um, were able to be obtained 22 minutes later, noted to have an improvement in his tachycardia, his blood pressure is 115 over 60, respiratory rate now 20, and still SATs of 98%. Transport was initiated at 25 minutes, his GCS was documented as 8. Um, I believe that uh, he was placed on a nasal cannula at six liters. Um, I guess I, I don't know for sure if it was just as part of per this cruise protocol or also because they noticed that his SATs went from 96 and 98 down to 93%. He was placed on end tidal CO2 um, and uh, he was reassessed frequently. It was noted at 35 minutes that his SATs, despite the six liters, was at 92% and that his end title was increasing from 45 to 51. And uh, he was um, dropped, he was transferred over to the hospital at 38 minutes. So I thought that this crew did a good job, um, both the fire crew and the transporting crew for documentation, documenting that they tried to verbally de-escalate this patient, um, that they had difficulty in assessing and treating this patient, and that uh, they were mindful enough to go and look at the vehicle to determine if this was all like head injury combativeness. Uh, they got a blood glucose, they placed him both on cardiac monitoring, but also continuous SpO2 and end tidal as soon as the patient would be cooperative enough to do that, and that uh, our fire colleagues had documented the response to treatment, which is something I think that we should be doing um, no matter if we're transporting or not, uh, how long it took. And according to their documentation, that he responded to the chemical sedation within five minutes um, favorably. Bad, uh, both both chemical restraints, both the Versed and Haldol were given at the exact same time in that uh, Benadryl was given uh, reportedly just for prophylaxis of extra pyramidal um, symptoms and uh, no IV access was um, documented or obtained and uh, a 12 lead was also not obtained given we don't know this patient's ingestion. So this, well, in the emergency room, he had a GCS of three uh, EMS, or sorry, uh, the ER doctor was notified by nursing that he was apneic. Uh, they quit, ran into the room to reassess him, uh, stimulate him. He started breathing again. Uh, there was a question to hypoxia, but that resolved after reassessment or, in, or stimulation of his respiratory drive with painful stimuli. He was unable to provide a history and given the reports of um, being taken down by police, but also with um, the fact that he had been in some type of car accident, the provider moved forward with um, complete, basically modified trauma assessment. So um, scanning, CT scanning of his body extensively, looking for any occult injuries as well as uh, laboratory and overdose workup. Um, he his workup was only significant for intoxication and there were no injuries on ct imaging he had a seven and a half hour er stay until his meds wore off and his um he sobered up enough to go home and this case was brought by the hospital staff um because of the concern of over sedation so it's a good opportunity to review in light of the um, national acknowledgement of 
um, pre-hospital sedation for agitated patients to go over some of the information that's currently available. Um, so delirious patients, it's kind of an umbrella term um, incorporating anybody who's got a disturbance in their consciousness, in their memory, their thought, their perception, or behavior. Psychotic patients, um, the, the definition is any thought or emotion impairment that's causing them to have a break with reality. Aggressive is anybody who's hostile or violent towards another in agitation is usually where we step in. Um, they can be anxious or nervous excitement. Uh, and then there's usually a breakdown of three ways that you can look at agitation. So cooperative, but agitated, they're not exactly thrilled, but they're going to cooperate with what's going on. The disruptive, but they're not a danger to you. They might be throwing something. They might be screaming. Um, and then lastly, our excited delirium uh, patients that are in the extreme um, agitation state. So I'm sure that this is probably a review for most of everybody on this call, but I think it's a good opportunity to kind of take um, this into consideration in trying to reduce the amount of um, adverse events in relation to our sedation. So our geriatric patients, they usually have Polypharm, um, they are on multiple drugs that uh, on a chronic basis, they have other medical comorbidities and they have a poor physiologic reserve. So that means that our chemical sedation can be um, can, can be extreme with how they respond to it, that a little goes a long way. So for that, they, and also the meds that we give for chemical sedation can lead to delirium. So um, the recommendations in the uh, medical community is to avoid, unless it's necessary, any sedation, and um, if necessary, to do maybe half dosing to try to see if you if that patient can respond to a smaller amount as opposed to um, what would be a typical adult dosing, uh, because these patients can have profound responses anywhere from being unarousable for an extended period of time because of metabolism um, or whatnot. And then our pediatric population, the challenges with them is that a lot of almost all of our drugs that we give is weight based. So trying to determine um, the weight of this patient, but also what the appropriate dose would be. And then also what is the preferred uh, sedation if you're really uh, thinking about potentially sedating a pediatric patient. I will look at our protocol in the next slide, but I, uh, um, that might be a situation you're in, in that doses of benzos at small to moderate amounts can have a paradoxical agitation response from a pediatric. So recognizing that as um, maybe not the preferred option and clearly getting medical control guidance on that or avoiding, if necessary, um, chemical sedation. And then I put in here psychiatric versus substance related. And I this is, this is more um, my reflection and uh, I didn't necessarily find it in my search for um, special population in, in treatment of agitation, but my experiences have been that a patient that has like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder can usually tolerate maybe a higher dose of an antipsychotic or, um, or potentially a sedative where our substance related, especially if they're not a professional, um, if, they're, uh, if they're intoxicated over the weekend, um, had binge drink um, this one time, that smaller amounts of meds would be more appropriate for those patients as opposed to our, psychi our chronically treated psychiatric patients who has a higher tolerance to our, um, our per se held all. And then our pregnant population, heaven forbid that you guys are in a situation where you're dealing with an agitated um, pregnant patient, but it's possible. So to be aware of the classes of um, our pregnancy class classes for the sedation that we do have for restraints or our options for um, our pregnant patients that are agitated. So all benzos are considered class D and that are um, have have good evidence that they can lead to birth defects in the fetus. 
uh, so should be avoided in that typical and atypical antipsychotics, including Haldol, are, are considered category C um, that are kind of no man's land. They're not sure. They're not they're not proven to be beneficial or to be safe, but they don't know for sure that there's a adverse response to um, giving them. And according to the American College of um, Obstetric Gynecology, they recommend if you have a pregnant patient who is agitated to be using Haldol um, as the preferred agent for sedation or for chemical restraint, I guess I shouldn't call it sedation. So excited delirium, I think that we can probably agree that that case, this case did not present as excited delirium. And it, you may argue that point, but um, this is a condition where they are delirious, there's psychosis, there's agitation, and there's catecholamine excess. Either the patient's own endogenous catecholamines and more likely related to um, exogenous catecholamines. These are p either PCP, uh, methamphetamine, cocaine, but in our population, more meth related potentially. And then they can either have um, a stimulation of their dopamine and NMD NMDA receptors. Mm -hmm. And they're usually in the setting of like a psychiatric illness or an organic medical problem. This is the extreme state of agitation. Um, some of the causes for the organic medical, well, organic medical or psychiatric are listed in this table to the right, and that these patients, excited delirium cases, have a high mortality risk. Um, the strongest association is related to respiratory depression, severe hyperthermia, and all of the data that I could find was severe hyperthermia was one of the highest correlation to morbidity, as well as acidemia or a combination of any of these. So the guidelines I was finding in regards to management of excited delirium are um, focusing on four categories, controlling the agitation, and that would be treating the underlying medical, um, treating the underlying uh, issues and addressing the behavioral symptoms and then quickly and effectively um, sedating or uh, reducing their agitation and then identifying any hyperthermia. So checking a temperature and then treating these like your environmental hyperthermia patients. So if they are hyperthermic, which you usually can tell by just tactile, but it, a better idea to get a, a temperature as well um, and then to uh, try to dissipate the heat if they um, do have an elevated temperature, avoiding any type of acidosis, so respiratory acidosis, metabolic acidosis, so um, adequately ventilating, uh, not a bad idea to probably get them on a non-rebreather mask to help from spitting, but also to ensure that they're not um, um, at least hypoxic, and then uh, IV fluids, especially because these patients have a high probability for a metabolic acidosis and then correcting any reversible causes um, that would be uh, outside of their psychiatric or substance abuse issue. All right, so um, here's our protocol in uh, uh, Clark County. I, Dr. Whitmer, correct me if I'm wrong, we don't have a age cutoff either direction, correct? So I didn't see an age cutoff. Um, so I, we don't usually deal with a lot of pediatric patients in the pre-hospital setting in general. So um, hopefully we don't have a lot of uh, pre pediatric um, agitation. But as you can see under the um, right side, I want to draw your attention to that the recommendations of our guide of our protocol is to treat with one agent, um, if you think that the patient's agitation is related to psychiatric illness, to do the um, mood dis mood stabilizer, which is Haldol or Geodon, not to give both concurrently and to give um, anywhere from 2.5, 2 to 5 milligrams IV or IM repeated every 15 minutes for a max dose of 10 on Haldol. Um, and then for Geodon, 10 milligrams IM only, and you can repeat 10 minutes later uh, with the a max dose of 20. If you feel like the um, agitation is due to a, a substance use or withdrawal, um, it'd be preferred to use a benzo. And um, 2.5 to 5 milligrams IV or 5 milligrams IM repeated 
um, as needed to max dose of 10 milligrams. And um, our guidelines for Benadryl is if you're treating extrapyramidal reaction, not as just a prophylaxis. Um, and that's one mg per keg IV IM max of 50 milligrams. If your patient is an excited delirium patient within our protocols, it's 10 milligrams of IM versed followed by 10 milligrams of Haldol IM um, to achieve substitution or to achieve sedation. And then you can substitute the Haldol with 20 milligrams of Geodon IM. No. And uh, the new protocols to be released in. Um, uh, in July, we'll have uh, uh, droperidol and apsine uh, uh, as a as a preferred as a preferred uh, uh, drug for um, for agitation, um, especially uh, especially if it's if it's thought to be at all psychiatrically uh, related or if it's in the category of excited delirium. Uh, and Duperidol has a much better sedative effect, but I, I think the point that I'd like to really emphasize on this case is this, this um, oh, what was blood alcohol? What was, I think it was two, in the two ranges yeah so he was and and he was uh as you say a relative uh a relative tyro uh, when it comes to uh alcohol apparently he's not a chronic drinker uh of history so uh he basically got just totally over sedated uh, to the point of having a gcs of three and becoming apneic and uh I think people are forgetting that Benadryl, especially at 50 milligrams, is is a very good uh, 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 sedative. <laughs> it, it's uh, and and so uh, it's uh, it basically he just got too much sedation um, with that combination of drugs and the alcohol that he wasn't that used to, and. And uh, I want to emphasize that there is no place in our protocol that says to give Benadryl prophylactically for EPS. It's to use it if you have EPS. Thank you. That's a good point. And one of the things that I should mention in um, giving feedback to this particular crew is that, um, you know, sometimes even our best efforts, we have iatrogenic um, complications. And if you if you are placing somebody, if you're concerned about someone's airway, make sure that you relay that to the doctor that's taking care of this patient. And if the doctor's not available, you can talk to a nurse, but oftentimes that's not relayed all the time, or I shouldn't say often, it could be not relayed. Uh, and if you have them on oxygen, I would want you to let them know I gave them oxygen just prophylactic or that um, they started to become a little bit hypoxic or their SAT started to drop because we don't always know why the place the person's on oxygen and we may just take them off or not put you know continue it and if you already determined that there was a concern, you need to make sure you relate that to the uh, um, hospital. All right, last case, 82-year-old male. He wasn't in a uh, parking lot, but it's a good picture of um, agitation, I think, of someone of uh, that sort. Anyways, uh, this was a called out for a violent psych, um, PPE usage appropriate. The patient was awake. Uh, his airway was open. He was protecting it. There was no active bleeding. His pulse was pre present and vital signs were obtained two minutes after a patient contact uh, notable for just tachypnea, no stats, but probably just out of ag agitation. Um, his past medical history included Parkinson's, dementia, neur neuropathy, um, pacemaker failure with a pacemaker, and uh, coronary artery disease, as well as hypothyroid. 
and the history provided came from the wife. Uh, the wife had stated that she called because the patient struck her and was verbally abusive towards her. She said that his behavior has been escalating over the last two weeks in that she's concerned for her safety. Um, he was recently prescribed Seroquel the day before in that she had given him a half dose of it after today, but really didn't seem to affect his behavior, that he also struck his daughter and that his wife is his caregiver and um, he's not able to take care for himself. So vital signs two minutes after patient contact, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the reports from the patient is that he has tremors and that was why she was struck. Um, he was refusing transport. He was answering orientation questions such as person, place, time, but he couldn't tell us, tell uh, our EMS colleagues what date it was, but he had um, recent recollection of his hospitalization, his new medication prescription. Um, Vancouver police arrived and stated that he did not have enough to hold him based off of information that was relayed to the law enforcement uh, and medical control was called for a refusal. So this is a case that uh, I was on the other side for medical control. Um, the information I was given was what I just given uh, you, you here in this lecture. And the additional information that was concerning was that this is a person, a patient who doesn't take care of himself um, at, a, on, at baseline. It wasn't clear if his wife was his enacted medical power of attorney or only in the event that his condition deteriorated significantly. And uh, she called because of his um, behavior and also because she didn't feel safe with him. So. I asked to speak to her to see what exactly is going on and what is her comfort level with him staying given that I'm being called to see to leave this patient there. In speaking with her, um, she had said that he not only punched her, but punched her daughter, but also grabbed a knife and threatened to kill both of them. Um, she had said that even though she's scared of him, that there's no one else to take care of him. So she would not leave the house if EMS left the patient there. She also provided additional information that he is in the process of getting um, accepted to a memory uh, care facility. This was a call over the weekend and uh, she had said that they have intake on Monday for that. So I think that um, based off of all the information she provided, we didn't have to potentially uh, leave her and her daughter with the uncontrollable um, patient. So I spoke with law enforcement. They had told me, I asked them, I didn't understand why this person didn't have meet the criteria to be held given that he not only assaulted them, but also had threatened them um, with a with a weapon. And he agreed that uh, that was not the information he was provided. According to our uh, EMS documentation, he did have to contact his supervisor, though, to get this person on a hold and that a whole, um, the patient was transported. Uh, EMS documentation um, included that the patient was still not very excited or um, verbally a co a cooperative with the fact that he was going to be taken to the hospital, but he never um, required any type of restraints or either physical or chemical as he was cooperative um, nonetheless of his uh, verbal protests. So vital signs, blood glucose, medical control, phone call. In looking at our protocols, I don't think that um, they necessarily needed to call, so I think that that was um, a good decision on their part because of this kind of gray territory. And then uh, where we could improve is that it seems like I didn't I don't feel like I asked questions that were um, more probing than anyone else would ask. So making sure you get a detailed history about what's going on, knowing that our patients that we leave behind um, are their highest risk for bad outcomes. And then what um, the capacity of refute, what a person has to have for a capacity for refusal. So in the emergency room, the patient was cooperative. He was very impulsive. Um, he wasn't any acute distress and impulsive, meaning that um, he, uh, 
he propositioned every um, female employee in the hospital that walked by him. Um, but he wasn't agitated. He wasn't violent at that point. Uh, he had told me that he had, his hands were flailing because of his Parkinson's and that his wife just ran into his hands and that it wasn't intentional. Um, and that he was admitted um, after talking with family to the hospital awaiting placement. During his hospital course, they felt that his behavioral issues were related to the Ativan that he was prescribed, so they discontinued it. Um, they discontinued it for about 10 days because he had a 12-day admission, uh, noting that his behavior improved significantly. They did do a formal um, cognitive assessment, and they felt that off the benzos, his uh, cognition was only mildly impaired. And then on hospital day 12, he was admitted to Avamir's uh, memory care memory care unit. So talking a little bit about decision making capacity, and this is a brief slide. There's much more that could be discussed about it, and I welcome any questions. But you, when I think about decision making capacity, you have to be able to determine if the patient has the ability to provide informed consent. So they have to be not intoxicated by drugs or alcohol, and they have to understand the nature of the illness or the mechanism of injury that they have sustained. They have to know the consequences of delaying that treatment or care or refusing it all outright. And then given that knowledge of the risks and the um, options for what they can do, they still choose to refuse. In this particular case, but reminded us the importance of, are they even their own decision maker? And then our protocol here breaks it down to patient of or decision maker capable of making informed decision and not capable of making informed decision. So if no medical need exists, a refusal form is not necessary. If there's a minor medical need, a refusal form is necessary. I was trying to think about what I think that this particular patient would fall under if it would be minor versus immediate medical care and or substance transport necessary. And given the acuteness of his threats and his violence, probably immediate. Although I think that um, if you, uh, I think if you're talking about refusal in, in the, and the decision point is this is a potent, this is a por person who's being reported as violent, probably consider that an immediate uh, medical care. So if they have the capacity to refuse either themselves or the decision maker, a refusal form is necessary and it must be completed. Every effort must be made to convince these patients um, or their caregivers that pre-hospital intervention transport is recommended and you can use their loved ones to try to persuade them. And if necessary, you can have law enforcement help you in that process. Law enforcement, mental health, um, and medical control is uh, recommended or mandatory. So if they are not capable of making their own decisions, you need to complete a refusal form um, or um, I shouldn't say not capable. Um, no one is capable of making informed decision. Um, have them complete a uh, refusal form. Every effort will be made to convince these patients to accept necessary pre-hospital intervention and or transport. And again, you're asking for family or loved ones to help persuade. Um, you're asking for law enforcement, mental health to help as well. And uh, if you, and then you're considering physical restraint and or sedation per medical control. Actually, I'm going to ask a question. I, I guess um, my understanding of uh, MIR may not be um, a refusal form. What is MIR? Medical information the report. So okay, so it's not it's not a refusal form. Sorry. Um, no. I don't don't know the abbreviation. I thought I did. So mayor, so these are not a patient that you would do a refusal form. You would try to get them to go with you um, cooperatively, either by asking family to con 
family or loved one to convince them or if necessary, getting law enforcement involved. Um, and then uh, you would potentially need to do a physical restraint or a chemical restraint to get them um, to, to go safely for both them and for you. Um, and then consult to medical control is mandatory. We're working with uh, law enforcement to, to try to be a more consistent with their they're they're having a number of changes. There's a couple of there's a couple of legislation le, legislative issues that happened this this session in the uh, at the state level that that is affecting how they're responding or what they're what they're willing to do. We're also uh, getting we will have the ability to or the medics will be able to get some help at times from the uh, adult uh, uh, crisis intervention team. Uh, but uh, I think the the one of the key questions that you need to that they that that crews should ask in a situation like this, a simple question to the wife would have made a, a very uh, would would have been very informative. And that question is, a question that's being asked frequently now by in hospitals and by doctors offices do do you feel safe being at home with this person or is there anything or or do you feel or do you feel unsafe and she said she felt unsafe that in and of itself is probably a reason to be more in depth at try to figure out exactly what the threat is going. On. I mean, the I'm Parkinsonian Parkinsonian uh, 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 Parkinsonian movements do not involve hitting people and hitting multiple different huh. people. Yeah, multiple different people. <laughs> Yeah, those were definitely um, definitely difficult cases, but cases that are really important that we do the right thing um, for the patient and their uh, their family. All right. Um, so, if the in summary for case one, anybody who is pain out of proportion. Pain out of proportion can be um, considered for a lot more than just dissections, but with chest pain, back pain, pain out of proportion, uh, suspicion for dissection should be high on your list. Uh, pulmonary fibrosis, again, is can be caused by multiple um, sources or idiopathic, and it leads to patients with poor, um, poor ventilation, um, poor, uh, gas exchange is what I'm trying to say. And then with our agitated patients, there's a spectrum of agitation anywhere from um, protesting but cooperative to uh, at extreme level paranoid psychosis, agitation with um, likely catecholamine, either um, their own body or taken by uh, stimulants leading to higher risk for mortality. So making sure that we're very conscientious about about uh, that that spectrum and appropriate assessment and treatment for that, and then refusals, patients that uh, need to have need to be, have the ability to have informed consent, and if there's a question to their ability to do informed consent, and that um, there's uh, no one else that is their decision maker, or if you ever have if you're not certain what to do, you can call medical control. So, I welcome any questions. Thank you for your attention. I know we went over a little bit. All right. Good cases. Thank you. Yeah, I don't see anything in the chat either. Thanks, Dr. Gabois. Yeah.